Special thanks to the uh, foundation and to Brian for inviting me back to the uh, proceedings at this meeting. Uh, I've been a huge fan of this uh, conference over the years, and it's uh, always a treat to be back. So thank you very much for allowing me to, to participate again this year. Um, uh, I would like to begin with uh, an outline, and I'll be discussing the renaissance of endocrine therapy, the reformation of HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer, and the enlightenment of triple negative breast cancer. I've been asked to cover all this in a space of 30 minutes, which reminds me of an incident with uh, former President Woodrow Wilson, who uh, on one occasion was asked by a reporter, how long does it take you to prepare a 20-minute speech? And President Wilson said, it takes me two weeks to prepare a 20-minute speech. And the reporter was taken aback at how long it took to prepare such a short speech. So the reporter said, well, how long would it take you to prepare a one-hour speech? And Woodrow Wilson said it would take one week, so a shorter amount of time for a longer speech. And uh, the puzzled, the reporter said, well, then how long will it take you to present a two-hour speech? And President Wilson answered, said, we could start that right now. So uh, <laughs> I spent a long time trying to get this down to 30 minutes. Uh, we'll begin with the Nobel Prize in 2001 in uh, Physiology and Medicine, awarded to Hartwell, Sir Paul Nurse, and Sir Richard Timothy Hunt. Hartwell needs no introduction here in Seattle because the work that he did was here at the University of Washington back in 1970 and 71, wherein he was describing uh, genes that regulated uh, cell proliferation of Baker's yeast, the so-called CDC genes. Uh, to complement uh, Hartwell's work, Sir Paul Nurse uh, cloned the human CDK gene based on homology to some of the yeast genes, and it has the same function in eukaryotic cells as it did in yeast. And uh, Sir Richard Timothy Hunt, working independently, uh, discovered cyclin in a sea urchin model at uh, Woods Hole, and then later uh, Cancer Research UK and University College London. So, of course, those findings have direct bearing on the figure shown on the left-hand side of the slide, which is the function of RB and E2F transcription factors. RB normally in its resting state is not phosphorylated, and it forms a complex with E2F transcription factors, which keeps the cell cycle from proceeding through the restriction point from G1 into the synthetic phase. However, upon activation of uh, NF-kappa B pathways, PI3 kinase A, KT, STATs, steroid receptors, MAP kinases, went beta catenin all these can result in activation of cyclin CDK complexes, and the cyclin-dependent kinases result in phosphorylation of RB. Phosphorylated RB releases E2F transcription factor, which then promotes the new synthesis of genes that will uh, allow uh, transition through the restriction point from G0, G1 into the synthetic phase. Now, interestingly, one of the targets of cyclin D1, um, I'm sorry, one of the targets of estrogen receptor activation actually is cyclin D1. So when you add estradiol to ER positive cells, that it will promote uh, transition through the cell cycle in ER positive uh, breast tumor cells. Many years later, uh, in the Slayman lab, Richard Finn and others were looking at a CDK4-6 inhibitor. Uh, this drug had been on the shelf at Pfizer for some time, having been studied in uh, all solid tumor trials, a mantle cell lymphoma trial, a myeloma trial, uh, and maybe one or two others, I think a sarcoma trial, and it really did not find a home in any of those diseases. It simply did not have activity to merit further drug development. And so uh, as that drug was sitting on the shelf, the Slayman lab took interest in it and said, we want to test this in breast cancer. We have a panel of 47 human breast cancer cell lines, and their hypothesis was this drug would most likely work on the most rapidly proliferating types of breast cancer, including triple negative breast cancer and perhaps HER2 positive breast cancer. That was the hypothesis going into this experiment. And on the upper right-hand side of the slide, what you see are cell proliferation results based on different subtypes of breast cancer, and the observed finding was exactly the opposite of that predicted. It worked in luminal ER positive breast cancer, not at all in triple negative breast cancers. It did, however, have some activity in HER2 positive breast cancer. Perhaps we'll touch on that a little bit later. So this uh, led to uh, 
you know, early phase, and then finally uh, pivotal phase three trials of CDK4-6 inhibitors in ER positive breast cancer, which has been uh, a new standard of care. Interestingly, the mechanism of action of these CDK4-6 inhibitors appears to be a senescence pathway on the lower right-hand side of the slide. You can see the beta-galactosidase activity indicating a senescence activity in these cells following exposure to this uh, CDK4-6 inhibitor. These are three of the pivotal phase three trials of aromatase inhibitors in combination with CDK4-6 inhibitors with all three of the now commercially available drugs, including palbociclib, ribociclib, and abemocyclib. They all boast objective response rates of about 55%, give or take, which are very respectable. Indeed, these response rates are more than you would expect from even combination chemotherapy in first-line ER positive metastatic breast cancer. And yet, for some reason, we see in market research data that there's a stubborn 25 to 30 percent of patients in this country who still get first-line chemotherapy for ER-positive metastatic breast cancer. And based on this analysis, I would say that's probably a mistake. Um, so be mindful, unless you have somebody that absolutely must have chemotherapy due to impending organ dysfunction, uh, that would be the only situation I could think of where chemotherapy or combination chemotherapy should be indicated, and that's probably less than 5% of all metastatic ER-positive patients indeed. And even then, uh, these response rates and repetitive response rival the best available chemotherapy. Um, you can see that the progression-free survival Kaplan-Meier curves are also highly similar. Uh, to further underscore that point, this paper was published in Clinical Cancer Research just last year, about a year ago, uh, highlighting similarities between the Mona Lisa II and the Paloma II PFS results based on the Kaplan-Meier uh, plots of both of these trials. This is a figure taken uh, as is from the paper as published. Now, when I was a fellow, I was taught that you shouldn't make cross-trial comparisons like this because there are perhaps subtle differences in clinical pathologic and demographic features of the patient populations under study, and there may be bias that's introduced as a consequence of that, and you, you should be very careful and circumspect about making cross-trial comparisons. Nevertheless, somehow this paper was published, and this was one of the figures, though to satisfy one of the reviewers, no doubt, in the figure legend for this figure, I quote in the lower left, cross-study inferences should not be made. So I found that rather amusing that, you know, why did they show the figure, why did they write the paper if they're not going to make cross-trial inferences? I think you can safely make cross-trial inferences in the case of the CDK inhibitors with regard to the efficacy outcomes. Now we were told by biostatistician experts that sadly it would not be possible to expect a survival benefit from any of the three pivotal trials or even the second or later line trials of CDK4-6 inhibitors. Because in human breast cancer, the survival post-progression in ER-positive disease is generally pretty long, usually more than a couple of years at the median. And the biostatisticians tell us that after the first PFS progression uh, in a first-line randomized trial, if the median survival post-progression is long, you need very large sample sizes in order to expect to find an OS benefit in these types of trials in these more indolent disease states in the metastatic setting. So for example, on the left-hand side of the slide, and this is published data by Broglio and Don Barry uh, in the JNCI back in 2009, for a power of 0.8, 2,440 patients would be required when the median survival post-progression is 24 months. And this is for any tumor type. And ER-positive breast cancer certainly falls into this category. Moreover, a 90-month follow-up duration would be needed to expect to see a survival benefit. All the three trials that I've just shown you had about maybe 700-odd patients or so and no more. So that's not nearly enough to expect to see a survival benefit. On the right-hand side, I, I, uh, right side of the slide, I quote uh, one of these biostatistics paper and read overall the power of these trials to demonstrate a statistically significant improvement in OS is less than 70 percent if the prolongation and median OS is less than or equal to 12 months, whatever the OS data maturity. And finally, a meta-analysis might be required to demonstrate an OS benefit. So that was the um, consensus of the experts. However, at ASCO, we saw data presented from the Mona Lisa 7 trial, which was 
in premenopausal patients, tamoxifen or AI plus gasarolin plus or minus ribocyclib. And this actually uh, achieved a statistically significant OS uh, efficacy signal with a p-value of two zeros after the decimal. So about a 29% relative reduction in risk of death, the p-value is 0 0.00973, crossed the pre-specified boundary to claim superior efficacy. Now before you get too excited about this particular combination, be mindful of the drug-drug interaction between tamoxifen and, and ribocyclob, which is a major interaction uh, that can lead to dose-related uh, prolongation of the QT interval, which can be serious or potentially even life-threatening. Nevertheless, I think it, this probably does demonstrate what I think will be a class effect. I don't know whether the, any of the other trials will be fortunate enough to be able to show differences in OS simply because of the statistical parameters that I showed you at the beginning. However, by, you know, by play of chance, it could be that one or more of the other trials may also come in positive. For the trials that have positive OS signals versus those that may not, I don't think that that means they have unique activity that distinguish them from the other CDK4-6 inhibitors. So be mindful that this is, in my opinion, a class effect, uh, probably, rather than some special attribute of ribocyclob in premenopausal patients. Now, um, all of you th probably think that you can probably re recall some patients who may not need a CDK4-6 inhibitor, who have such indolent disease that you know in your heart they'll probably do just fine with an AI as a single agent, as a PO drug, or perhaps fulvestrant as a single agent. Um, but if you look at the forest plot for any of these trials, it calls that notion into question. Let's take a look at the most indolent patients, for example, in this uh, palbocyclob trial, uh, the Paloma 2 study. So if you look at the top red box, that is bone-only disease, you would think, well, maybe those patients may not need a CDK4-6 inhibitor because we know that bone-only disease has a more favorable prognosis, and yet you can see they'll do even better if they take uh, 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 palbocyclob along with an aromatase inhibitor. What about long disease-free interval? Look at the second box from the top. Disease-free interval greater than 10 years. The point estimate on the hazard ratio is still well to the left of unity with a significant p-value. So even in that instance, an, a disease-free interval of greater than 10 years will still do better on the combination than on an AI alone. What about just one disease metastasis site? The third box from the top. Same story, doesn't matter if it's one site versus two or more, uh, both categories benefit from addition of a CDK inhibitor. What about the elderly? Maybe some elderly patients don't need CDK inhibition because they probably have indolent disease, et cetera. But if you look at the younger versus older than age 65 groups, uh, there's no difference in the hazard ratios favoring the combination of CDK inhibition plus an AI. So you'd be hard pressed to find a patient who wouldn't, in theory, potentially benefit. That said, if they can't tolerate the CDK inhibitor class of drugs, that may be a different story. And certainly those patients may be ideally uh, uh, suited with just a single agent endocrine therapy uh, strategy. Now, uh, which of these three CDK4-6 inhibitors would you choose? I've shown you that the efficacy signals appear to be all uh, about the same. Uh, cross trial inferences aside. So if there's equal efficacy amongst agents in cancer medicine, then you want to maximize the therapeutic eff efficacy, uh, therapeutic index rather, um, by choosing the drugs that are the least toxic. Um, and this slide compares the safety signals from all three of the available CDK4-6 inhibitors. You can see that palbocyclob has uh, arguably uh, the highest rate of neutropenia, abemocyclob, more diarrhea and nausea, QTC prolongation is found with ribocyclob. So in my view, it probably doesn't matter to me which of these three agents you use, and it may be a case-by-case -case basis depending on um, other comorbidities that your patient may have, and you may choose one of these drugs over another for that reason. And so uh, it's in the eye of the beholder, and it's up to you to decide. I think it's fair to discuss the pros and cons of each approach with patients and let the patient weigh in if they have a strong preference one way or the other uh, based on the known safety signals of these agents and the complexity of doing the workup, including EKGs, et cetera.
Moving on to the PI3 kinase AKT mTOR pathway as a target for combinations with anti-endocrine strategies, uh, the first uh, to show uh, a positive doublet therapeutic approach was actually letrozolapatinib in triple positive uh, breast cancer, that is HER2 positive and steroid receptor positive. Following that, we had introduction of uh, Everlimus exomustane uh, as a strategy to target mTOR. And there's been an intense focus on targeting PI3 kinase inhibitors with both pan-PI3 kinase inhibitors and selective PI3 kinase inhibitors, particularly the alpha-specific uh, subunit of PI3 kinase. And uh, despite a whole lot of work in this area, many of these trials, though they may have shown some efficacy signals, uh, failed largely due to toxicity uh, that has been really the uh, impediment to getting this class of agents approved. At the bottom of the slide on the right, I'm show, I've shown you the three uh, CDK4-6 inhibitors that we just discussed. The, all the green fonts are currently FDA approved. And next, I'll highlight the new FDA approval of Alpelisib, the alpha-specific PI3 kinase inhibitor for PI3 kinase mutant ER positive disease. This uh, combination uh, was just approved by the FDA on May 24th of this year. Uh, these are the top line data from the Alpalisib plus fulvestrant uh, randomized trial, placebo controlled. You can see a significant prolongation in PFS, which was the primary endpoint. Please be mindful that this class of agents does have toxicities that one must be mindful of, including but not limited to hyperglycemia and also particularly cutaneous rash. Uh, these rashes can be uh, significant and can get out of control, so I'd be early to refer a patient to a dermatologist if you see some of the rashes with this, uh, this agent. Uh, there's also some GI toxicity, some weight loss, fatigue, nausea, stomatitis, uh, et cetera. Another lesson learned in some of the trials in the development of uh, PI3 kinase inhibitors for uh, mutant or activated PI3 kinase pathway uh, is that circulating tumor DNA may actually be more predictive than archival primary tumor tissue in discovering mutant PI3 kinase gene. And it also happens to be more convenient because you can get it as a blood test. In the buparlisib trial, for example, there was a 21% increase in detection of mutant PI3 kinase by using circulating tumor DNA contempor contemporaneous at the time of study entry. So be mindful of that and don't rely solely on the archival material uh, from a tumor bank for making that determination. So this is the treatment sequence then for steroid receptor positive metastatic breast cancer, the so-called nine lives of endocrine therapy, of which I've only shown five, but there are more. Uh, Non-steroidal aromatase inhibitors with CDK4-6 inhibition. Obviously, if somebody has progressed while on a non-steroidal aromatase inhibitor, perhaps you'd want to use fulvestrant even in the first line along with a CDK4-6 inhibitor. Second line, there's fulvestrant with or without everolimus. If you're a believer in the SWOG0102 data, which showed positive uh, PFS outcomes by addition of Everolimus to fulvestrin. And then I've just shown you the Alpelisub data for PIK3CA mutant cases. That's an obvious second line choice, although that study was not done in CDK4-6 progressors, uh, mind you. Uh, Everolimus and aromatase inhibitor would be an obvious choice in the third line, fourth line, a CIRM, a high dose estrogen is still out there. And obviously, if uh, the patients become endocrine refractory at any, at any point along this journey, then they would switch to, to chemotherapy. Next, I want to talk about uh, HER2 and give you an update on some of the newer approaches to treat HER2 positive breast cancer. And I think it's actually ironic that in evolutionary terms, HER2 kinase domains and CDK kinase domains have a shared structure. I've just shown you a lot of the data about cyclin CDK2 complexes and, and CDK4 and CDK6. They have this unique uh, end lobe structure with this p stair helix. You're looking down the barrel of that helix in this slide. Uh, you see these uh, helical structures here. And if you look at the, in this case, the EGF receptor HER3 kinase domain interaction and the HER2 HER3 kinase dom domain interaction is highly similar. It shares this end lobe, this uh, p stair uh, helical structure, and these helical domains here are shared with CDK2 complexes. So over evolutionary 
time scales of perhaps hundreds of millions or billions of years, the HER family of receptor kinases have adopted a very similar strategy as did the CDK2 kinases, uh, uh, you know, in evolutionary terms. Moreover, in the case of HER3, there are six phosphotyrosine sites that form uh, docking sites for PI3 kinase to activate downstream signaling. So HER2, HER3 complexes are particularly mitogenic. So now we have data showing that trastuzumab binds to a unique epitope on the HER2 extracellular domain near the, the, uh, the cell membrane, and pertuzumab uh, binds to a different domain on HER2. Uh, and since these are non-overlapping epitopes, you could give both antibodies at the same time and achieve different biological effects. For instance, Trastuzumab blocks HER2, HER3 association on this immunoprecipitation western blot analysis in the absence of HER3 activating ligand called herregulin or neuregulin, whereas pertuzumab, by blocking the dimerization domain of HER2, blocks ligand herregulin dependent HER2, HER3 association. So the combination blocks HER2, HER3 associations that are either ligand independent or dependent covers all the bases. Moreover, when you give both antibodies, you actually induce programmed cell death, whereas with each antibody alone, you cannot achieve that desired goal. And this has resulted in important therapeutic translation. If you just focus on the OS endpoint in the first-line Cleopatra trial in HER2-positive metastatic disease, you can see that by simply adding a second antibody to a taxane and trastuzumab, you get a shift of nearly 16 months at the median in overall survival, so an extraordinary improvement in outcomes simply by adding a second HER2 antibody. There's also a marked increase in the objective response rates. However, this does come at some price. There's more myelosuppression and more GI toxicity when you add pertuzumab to the regimen. Uh, to manage the GI toxicity, it's often necessary to lower the dose of the taxane chemotherapy component. That can be helpful along with anti-motility anti agents if needed to mitigate against that toxicity. In the second line, TDM1 is firmly entrenched in metastatic disease. Remember, TDM1 was actually discovered by accident. Uh, it was thought back in the mid-2000s that uh, you had to fine-tune the linker chemistry with antibody drug conjugates. You wanted chemistry that was stable enough to survive in the circulation and not fall apart and release the toxic drug in the circulation, but not too stable so that when it reaches its tumor target, in this case HER2, it would release the chemo agent and that would diffuse into the target cell and kill it. That was the idea. So Gail Phillips and Mark Slikowski at Genentech designed an experiment to fine tune the linker chemistry and they developed reagents with increasing stability of the linkers, of these disulfide cleavable linkers, and as a negative control for this experiment, they added a non-cleavable linker, which they reasoned would have no activity. This would bind to HER2, and it would just be stuck on the cell surface. That was the idea. It shouldn't work. This proved to have the most activity. So it was by mistake. This is TDM1. In hindsight, what was happening is receptor-mediated endocytosis into the early and late endosomes, re resulting in trafficking to the lysosome, where this entire complex is degraded all the way down to the single amino acid level. So if you extract DM1 from HER2-positive TDM1-treated cells, what you'll find is that the primary DM1-containing cytotoxic catabolite is actually the DM1 still stuck to the MCC linker stuck to the lysine amino acid that was originally in the trastuzumab antibody backbone. That amino acid is still there, but it still disrupts tubulin and kills the tumor target. So a happy accident. These are the uh, published data from the pivotal trial showing the PFS endpoint with statistical confidence leading to FDA approval back in 2012 or so. And then recently we just uh, published the final OS analysis of the same Amelia phase three pivotal trial showing a significant improvement in uh, median overall survival as well uh, when comparing TDM1 against control of capecitabine lapatinib in patients with prior paclitaxel and uh, trastuzumab. Uh, be mindful that there are follow-on antibody drug conjugates in the HER2 space to keep your eye on. The one that's farthest along is called trastuzumab deruxtecan or DS8201. This is a uh, 
a chemistry that binds just to cysteine, so it has about eight cytotoxic molecules per HER2 antibody backbone. Uh, the payload here is simply a TOPO1 inhibitor. So uh, uh, remarkably uh, a drug class with which you're already well familiar. These are the data in HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer patients. The waterfall plot is shown with a very high objective response rate and quite durable responses on the swimmer's plot over time. And this antibody drug conjugate also has activity even in HER2 low uh, patients, that is patients with IHC one or two plus and FISH negative, about a 38.5% response rate in a small study here. Now again, these ADCs have chemo-like toxicities. In the case of this particular agent, um, interstitial lung disease has come to light as a serious problem. And as a consequence, uh, all these patients have to be followed very closely for any incidence of interstitial lung disease. And if found, the drug should be discontinued and steroid co-medication should be uh, considered. Next, I'll talk about small molecule kinase inhibitors. At ASCO, we saw the presentation of the phase three registrational intent NALA NALA trial, which is niratinib capecitabine head to head against lapatinib capecitabine, which as you recall, was FDA approved many years ago. Um, this was a positive result in terms of the time to intervention for symptomatic CNS disease was longer in the experimental arm. The PFS hazard ratio was 0.76 with statistical confidence. The OS uh, uh, signal was not met at this time. The objective response rate also was not statistically significant, though num numerically greater in the neuratinib arm. In the conclusion of the abstract, the authors state, quote, tolerability was similar between the two arms. I don't know what they mean by this because the next sentence says that grade three diarrhea was increased by double. Also be mindful of the subset analysis, which I think may be important for such a toxic regimen as this one. If I had to pick a drug to mix with neratinib, the last thing I would choose, arguably, would be a fluoropyrimidine. This is an extremely challenging uh, combination to give in my view, and it is, uh, is it's, I give you caution that the treatment intent of metastatic breast cancer is palliation. You're not gonna cure any of these patients, you want to make them feel better. It's, it's, it could be tough to do that with this regimen. Also, be mindful that the non-visceral only patients, which were a minority, uh, had a more favorable outcome with neuratinib. The visceral uh, cases less so, with a lower, uh, a lesser hazard ratio, I should say, and that was statistically different. And also, the hormone receptor status differed. The hormone receptor negative patients fared better with this combination compared to the hormone receptor positive patients. That also rose to the level of statistical significance. So when you're making difficult decisions, uh, these types of analysis may come into play for selected patients. I would probably consider this regimen for a patient with brain metastasis. This drug is active in the brain. The TBCRC had done a previous trial of this regimen showing uh, a respectable overall response rate of 49%. Uh, but for other patients, uh, I would be circumspect because of the toxicity. Uh, hopefully, neratinib will be replaced by more specific drugs that have a focus on HER2 kinase to the exclusion of EGF receptor kinase. You can hear, see here the IC50s for EGF receptor are 10,000-fold, whereas low nanomolar uh, targeting ability for tucatinib against HER2 kinase. This trial is underway. The sample size has recently been increased to more than 600, which will de delay its public presentation probably to the end of the year or early next. Um, this is capecitabine, trastuzumab, tucatinib versus placebo, primary endpoint PFS in all patients. So stay tuned for this. This could rehabilitate tyrosine kinase inhibitors in the HER2-positive metastatic space. Uh, finally, in the HER2 space, I can't uh, end without mentioning the SOFIA trial, which is also presented this ASCO. That is margituximab, which is an engineered HER2 antibody. It's a chimeric antibody. It has an engineered FC domain with five different mutations in the FD domain that were introduced deliberately. These five mutations allow greater binding affinity to activating FC receptors on NK cells and have lower binding affinity to decoy negative regulatory receptors on NK cells. So in composite, this engineered FC HER2 antibody has more potent ADCC activity, particularly in patients that carry low affinity alleles of activating FC receptors, which is about 85% of the population have some uh, low affinity alleles uh, 
that have less response to HER2 antibodies in the absence of this type of engineering. In the intent to treat population, there was a significant, though subtle, shift in median PFS. It did reach statistical confidence, but in these low affinity alleles, that is, that is phenylalanine at position uh, 158 of the FC gamma R3A receptor instead of valine amino acid, um, there the shift was somewhat greater uh, at the median in PFS, and this may be more clinically meaningful, and this did reach statistical confidence as well. So one wonders, will this be an F allele drug, in fact? Um, it's probably of no great consequence since 85% of us do carry F alleles, uh, but nevertheless, uh, with a greater efficacy signal, I wonder whether regulators will be more interested in pursuing this data set versus this. Uh, the OS data, which are forthcoming, will probably make that determination for the regulators and for us. Uh, there are increased infusion reactions with margituximab, about 14% compared to about 4%, but otherwise similar safety profile and no change in cardiac dysfunction. So to summarize the HER2 space, First line, taxane, trastuzumab, pertuzumab, or for selected ER-positive patients, you could choose endocrine therapy with or without a HER2-targeted agent. There's data from the Pertain trial and from the alternative trial showing that three drug combinations with pertuzumab, trastuzumab, and an AI, or lapatinib, trastuzumab, and an AI are superior to either single-agent HER2-targeted therapy alone. So those might be preferred for some patients who may not be chemo candidates or have a more indolent disease. Second line, TDM1 is fairly firmly entrenched uh, as we uh, sit here today. And then finally, uh, in the later lines, probably uh, lapatinib-based combinations until naratinib gets FDA approval with the NALA regimen or chemo du jour plus trastuzumab. Don't forget, however, many HER2-positive metastatic breast cancer patients these days are anthracycline naive, and about 35% of those probably have topo-2 gene amplification and could, in theory, be quite responsive to anthracyclines. So don't leave out that class in anthracycline naive patients. Finally, to wrap up this uh, whirlwind uh, metastatic breast cancer talk, I will focus on triple negative breast cancer briefly. These are the data from the Impassion 130 trial, which is a registrational placebo-controlled phase three trial of NAB paclitaxel with or without atezolizumab in first line triple negative metastatic breast cancer. In the intent to treat population, though it reached its statistical endpoint with confidence, you can see that the efficacy signals are subtle. However, in the PDL1 positive subgroup analysis, there was a more marked shift and improvement in the hazard ratio down to 0.62, again with statistical confidence. So this now is arguably the preferred first line treatment for triple negative metastatic breast cancer. And uh, on March the 8th, the FDA approved this regimen for pdl one positive metastatic triple negative breast cancer. A companion diagnostic, the Ventana assay, uh, is in the package insert as the preferred pdl one IHC detection antibody for this regimen. The overall survival signal is also impressive here, uh, about a seven-month shift at the median in overall survival. Uh, this is really historic in terms of uh, metastatic triple negative breast cancer. And uh, so I think this is gonna be an important therapeutic advance indeed. Be mindful, of course, of checkpoint antibody toxicities, which are all of the inflammatory states in any organ. And so you have to be uh, on the lookout for these. And the safety data did show increased adverse events of special interest, particularly the autoimmune phenomenon with the atezolizumab nab paclitaxel combination compared to placebo, as you would expect. Now, moving on to chemotherapy considerations. Uh, the TNT trial data were published within the past couple of years. This is a, a randomized trial comparing carboplatin to docetaxel in first-line uh, triple negative uh, metastatic breast cancer. And in the intent to treat population that were not selected otherwise, you can see that the results were quite similar in terms of response rates. However, in the triple negative breast cancer patients that harbored BRCA1 or 2 mutations, there was a benefit uh, for carboplatin as compared to docetaxel in these BRCA mutant cases, whether it was germline or somatic. So if you have a BRCA mutant case and you're considering using chemotherapy, a platinum-based regimen, if they're platinum-naive from the neoadjuvant and adjuvant setting, would probably be the best selection for a cytotoxic-based regimen. This just highlights that a majority of BRCA1 mutants are indeed basal-like and often have a triple-negative phenotype. 
And uh, because of these uh, BRCA1 and 2 mutants, that affords another opportunity for us in triple negative breast cancer to treat these patients with uh, poly-ADP ribose polymerase inhibitors. Uh, and there are now two pivotal trials with both olaparib and telozoparib that have shown positive phase three pivotal trial results. Both of these are now approved and available for your consideration. They are not without toxicity, however, and also it's important to point out that carboplatin was not allowed in the control arm of either of these pivotal trials. It would be interesting to know how that would have fared against these PARP inhibitors, but uh, these were both uh, chemo of uh, physician's choice except for carboplatin. Be mindful of the toxicities of this class of agents, particularly myelosuppression is a, is a significant problem. Talazoparib is challenged with somewhat more anemia as compared to olaparib. Uh, as well, fatigue can be an issue also, as well as GI toxicity. Next, we'll talk briefly about antibody drug conjugates that are under investigation in triple negative breast cancer. Uh, Seattle Genetics has this LIV1A uh, antibody drug conjugate, and the IMMU132 compound has a uh, Govatecan uh, payload. These drugs have been shown to have activity in early phase clinical trials thus far. Um, these targets, the zinc transporter LIV-1 is internalizable, and just as the case of TDM-1, this can traffic to the lysosome and release the payload intracellularly in the tumor target. A high fraction of breast cancers express LIV-1, and so this is a, an attractive uh, target, and you can see uh, anecdotal evidence of efficacy in this uh, uh, CT image uh, shown. Uh, another antibody drug conjugate, uh, targets the uh, trope 2 um, uh, protein, which is an epithelial glycoprotein antigen encoded by the TAS, TACSTD2 gene. Um, uh, in this phase 2 trial, they had a confirmed objective response rate of 30 percent, median response duration of about nine months, clinical benefit rate uh, 46 percent. So impressive results indeed. Both of these are still under further investigation and will hopefully make it through uh, regulatory uh, pathways and be approved. Uh, next, I'll talk about the PI3 kinase pathway once again, in this case in the context of AKT, um, which is activated uh, following uh, multiple pathway activation um, and can direct uh, proliferation and program cell death pathways downstream. Um, there can be a gain of function alterations, as I've shown you previously, like mutation of PI3 kinase. There can be mutations in AKT itself. There can be overexpression of receptor kinase that can activate this pathway. Or there can be loss of negative regulators of this pathway. P10 is the prototype. And uh, AKT can be activated by prior exposure to chemotherapy or endocrine therapy. So it's an ideal target in breast cancer from that theoretical point of view. Um, at the last uh, ASCO in uh, 20, I think, 18, uh, we saw data from two uh, AKT inhibitor trials in combination with paclitaxel. Um, one was this, uh, uh, I can't pronounce it, but it's cabifacertib, and the other one is ipatacertib, uh, just to make it difficult for future medical students and fellows to remember. Uh, both of these had positive efficacy signals, and in my estimation, uh, the safety signals were uh, acceptable. Um, overall survival signals also with both of these agents. So this could form the framework for uh, a new paradigm in triple negative breast cancer as well, um, and these should be studied in future phase three trials. So in conclusion for the triple negative component of the talk, first line, NAP paclitaxel plus atezolizumab is probably the preferred new first line regimen, except for patients that have BRCA mutations where PARP inhibition versus platinum-based regimens could also be considered. Uh, second line, uh, in terms of ordinary standard of care, not including uh, clinical trial options, then chemo du jour is still uh, what you'd probably use off protocol for these patients. Third line, still chemo du jour or other investigational agents, such as some of the ones that I've shown you, the new ADCs, the AKT pathway inhibitors, or trials based on DNA sequence analysis, et cetera. In conclusion, there's a survival benefit now observed with CDK4-6 inhibition in combination with endocrine therapy. Alpelacib, fulvestrin, prolonged progression-free survival amongst patients with PIK3CA mutated hormone receptor positive, HER2-negative advanced breast cancer who had received endocrine therapy previously. Uh, 
Allosteric activation of HER2, HER3 complexes is an important my mitogenic stimulus disrupted by pertuzumab and by HER2, HER2 bispecifics. I didn't have time to show you that data. Small molecule orally bioavailable HER2 TKIs are active and achieve CNS penetration. In patients with progressive disease following trastuzumab, pertuzumab, chemotherapy, and TDM1, consistent benefit of margituximab in combination with chemo was seen across all endpoints, particularly in the low affinity allele F carriers. And finally, atezolizumab plus nabpaclitaxel is approved by the FDA and is recommended for treatment of patients with pd one positive metastatic triple negative disease. PARP inhibition is superior to non-platinum chemo, a physician's choice as first-line treatment for BRCA mutant triple negative breast cancer. Investigations are underway studying new ADC target epitopes. And finally, AKT inhibition in combination with paclitaxel warrants further clinical investigation. Thank you very much for your attention. Good afternoon.